We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. Uh oh, thrift diving. Hey, what's up? I'm Serena Pia from thriftdiving.com, which is a podcast, a blog, and a YouTube channel that helps you decorate, improve, and maintain your home with paint, power tools, and thrift stores without sacrificing your budget, the environment, or style. Welcome to episode 92 of the Thrift Diving Podcast. I'm really excited to talk about this episode because we are going to talk about seven controversial projects that I've done and some of those criticisms that people have said, and where are they now? Were they right? Did they make comments that came back to bite me in the butt? (laughs) Were these people right? Well, I can tell you most times people online They can be mean, but sometimes they can also, I say most times, people are generally kind and good. I don't know if you feel that way, because I think sometimes the news tends to give you all the negative of things that people say and do, but I think for the most part, people are good. And you're not going to get a lot of comments, a lot of negative comments from people, unless you do just do something that's totally egregious, (laughs) right? And then people will come out of the woodwork. But if you are a creator like me, and you put something out there for the world to view, to look at, whether it's YouTube, just your personal Instagram, Facebook, whatever, you might have a couple of negative comments. But for the most part, if people don't like it, they're going to scroll by. The people who are going to comment for the most part are the people who like what you've done. And I think that can be a scary thing to put it out there and, and get feedback from people on, well, did it look right? Did it look wrong? And I think, you know, there's several reasons why projects can be controversial. And I think the first one is that maybe you just used the wrong product, right? Like I have seen videos, well, and I've done it myself, where you've done a project and you thought that you were supposed to use like product A, and you ended up using product B. And sometimes people will come out of the woodwork and say, why did you use product A? You're supposed to use product B. And it may seem like it's a negative criticism, but it's really just to educate you, right? Sometimes people can say it in a mean way, and that can hurt your feelings. But it can also be, I think, feedback for you so that next time when you do a project, oh, yeah, that's right, I got to use, I got to use, like, you know, product B. (laughs) So you just note that for the next time. And also, I think sometimes people can raise a lot of, I don't know, controversy, controversy, that's not even a word, controversy about a project, because maybe you skipped a step, right? Sometimes people think, for example, when you're painting furniture, people sometimes are just like, you have to prime, you can't paint furniture without priming. And then there's other people like me that say, well, you may not always have to prime. Sometimes you can skip it depending on the paint, depending on the quality of the wood that you're painting or whatever you're painting. Maybe it's laminate. You might not have to prime. And so sometimes some of that controversy that comes up is you skipped a step. You were supposed to do this and you just went from one to three. Where's step two? So that's sometimes what can make a project seem uh, more controversial, right? And I think another thing is sometimes you just do something shocking. (laughs) You know, maybe you use a certain color or people have never thought of using a tool in that way. And so it just becomes this controversial thing that, I don't know, sometimes it goes viral. Sometimes controversy is good for a project. And I think sometimes people just suck, right? They, I, I mean, I, like I said, most times, I think generally people are kind, but there are some people, these keyboard warriors who love to just make comments. Can I tell you, I don't know if I even told you this. Maybe I did, but I had sent out a email some time ago with that really cute pink sewing table that I did, right? Like if you're on my mailing list or you follow me on Instagram or Facebook, YouTube, whatever, you will know that I guess about a month ago, I had done a really cool project. Maybe it was a month and a half ago where I took a uh, $40 sewing table that I got from the thrift store and I painted it pink, but it wasn't just paint. It was like a stain, a color stain. And I thought it was really cool. I mean, I did Mod Podge with really pretty paper on the front and on the inside, and it just turned out so cute. 
Well, can you believe (laughs) this has never really happened? Somebody responded back and I think it was like, I think it was a dude, right? And I'm thinking, why are you even subscribed to thrift diving? Like it, how is this even relevant to you? They responded back and said something so egregious. They, and first, and they cursed at me too, right? They said the SH word (laughs) and they were like, oh, that looks like shh. And you know, this just looks horrible. And I could have responded back with something just as hateful. And I thought, oh my gosh, if I did that, they could screenshot it, post it everywhere. And then that just makes me look bad. So, you know, like Michelle Obama had said, when they go low, you go high. So I went high on this message back to him. And I said, you know, your life must really be, you know, you must really be hurting on the inside or something to that effect. Like, I really hope that you get counseling for that because I would never respond back. And I think I just blocked the person. That is very unusual. Most people don't leave such hateful email messages like directly to you or even on YouTube. Now, I did get some messages and I'll talk about this in a moment on a reel that it started going viral. Well, I'm not going to say viral, but it started getting a lot of traction back during, I guess it was the earlier part of 2022. I'll share that in a moment, but it was about some of the electrical stuff that I'd done in my, that I'd done in my she shed. And there were some, some really egregious comments, but for the most part, I think people are kind, but sometimes people suck. You have those few bad apples that make the entire basket seem like they're tainted and it's not, it's just one or two bad apples, but everything else in that basket is good. It tastes good. It doesn't have brown spots, but again, that can be one of the reasons that projects are controversial is just because some people suck, but generally people are good. If they like your, your project or whatever it is that you're putting out there, they'll comment. If they don't like it, they may just keep scrolling. But anyway, let's jump into these seven projects. And I'll tell you what the issues were. I was going to go back and actually find some real comments that people had made about these projects, but we don't need to hear the hateful comments. <laughs> we don't. Let's just focus on, you know, the gist of what they said. And then I'll tell you where they are now. Okay, so the first one was my fire pit. And I just recently in the last maybe three or four episodes, did a podcast episode on how to do a fall fire pit. You can go back and listen to that. It's also down in the show notes. But there were some comments that people had made in the tutorial on YouTube, and it's got like 3.4 million views. It's a it's every year, it just does very well in the spring, spring and fall for the most part. But some of the issues that people had were And I'll just talk about maybe one of them. But the main issue was that I didn't use sand under the edgers. Remember, for this fire pit, I was trying to create this seating area to go around the fire pit. I had done the fire pit the previous year. Then I had gotten this uh, sponsored video with Home Depot. And they wanted me to use these edgers to do something with the edgers. And I thought, oh, this would be a great way to create like a seating area around the fire pit. And I didn't use sand. Now, generally, when you're using edgers, you're going to want to use sand underneath of them, right? You're going to you're gonna, gonna kind of dig down just a little bit so that those edgers are not sitting directly up, you know, grass level on your grass. You're going to want to dig down a little bit so that they're more embedded into your lawn. But in order to make sure that they're secure, you're going to use sand. Well, I skipped that step. You know, as I said, remember, sometimes when projects are controversial, it's because you skipped a step. Well, I skipped the sand. And people, not a lot, but sometimes all it takes is one or two people that can make it feel like it's a whole room screaming at you. They were like, oh my gosh, I can tell you, like, you know, by next year, those edgers are all going to be messed up and out of place. And guess what? That didn't happen. Those edgers still look great. It looks just like how I did it a year and a half ago. It, they didn't shift or anything. And, you know, I think it could also depend on the edgers that I used. The edgers that I used, I think it was called, oh gosh, I don't remember the name. I, you'll, I'll leave the link down below so you can find that blog post or that video. But they sort of interlock together. And so because, maybe because of the, the edgers that I used, they held their position. So yes, even though I skipped a step, it still looked great. And when I go out there now, 
it's still holding its shape. It doesn't look like it's it's all jumbled up. Now, the biggest problem that I am having with the fire pit, and you may remember this from that episode, there's weeds all in the, the seating area. It, I, I just cannot figure out how to keep the weeds at bay. And it's just been such a huge problem. Like right now out there, there's so many weeds and they're getting high. So I keep trying to pull them out, but then they, you know, they kept coming back. Well, now everything's going dormant. So I think this is a time for me to go through and just start, you know, pulling the weeds that are in there. But maybe it's once a week, maybe I need to go through with some vinegar, which will kill the weeds. Once, you know, things start growing again in, I would say, probably March or April, and just get out there once a week and just spray down that whole seating area to try to keep those weeds at bay. It's not that they're coming up from underneath, because I did put cardboard down. And that was actually another thing that people said, oh, you shouldn't have used cardboard underneath of that fire pit. That That's going to draw a lot of termites and and other, well, did they say just termites? I think they mentioned just termites to the yard. And that's what I was really afraid of because previous summers, I've seen termites in my yard and I was really worried that that would create a huge problem. Well, my house has been treated for termites and it was not related to the fire pit, but you know, that the, the whole termites issue is a whole different conversation. And if you want to listen to that conversation, go back to the previous episode. I think it might be episode five. Go to the show notes and click on where um, you'll see the episode of, I did an actual interview with my bug guy, <laughs> with my exterminator. And we talked about termites. We talked about bed bugs and carpet beetles. So that's a very, very interesting conversation. If you've missed it, go back and listen to it. But I was concerned that putting the cardboard down would be a uh, feeding frenzy for termites. And maybe it maybe it was. I don't know the answer to that. But I did treat my house for termites just because I knew that prior to that, we'd had some activity. So, but again, to answer the, to, to answer the question of, did those edgers hold their position? They did. It looks, it still looks good. I just have to figure out how to combat the weeds. All right, so that was the first controversial project. The second one was, and I mentioned this earlier, my shed electric. Oh my gosh. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, about a year ago, I bought a 16 by 26 she shed and I I bought it from Tough Shed and they installed it, but my goal was to do as much of the interior finishing as possible. Now, one of the things that that I ended up doing was installing the electrical myself. Now, I I didn't do it just myself. I did have the advice of a master electrician who happened to be my instructor at the community college. You see, I did a carpentry program at my community college. And one of the election, the elective courses that I did was um, actually two electrical wiring classes. Well, the professor for that class, he has his own company and I reached out to him when it got to the point where I was ready to put electricity in my shed. And I said, can you please come and do this for me? (laughs) You know, do you still have your company? Can you do this? And he said, you know, I think you can do this yourself with a little bit of handholding. I'll come by as needed just to make sure that you're on track. But I think that you can do this yourself. And I did. He was fantastic. And I learned so much about electrical wiring that it was like a puzzle and I love puzzles. If you if you know me, I freaking love puzzles. And electricity is like a puzzle. You have to figure out how to get the electrons from the box to your lights, to your receptacles, and it was just an amazing project. And of course, I filmed everything and I was putting reels on Facebook. Well, a couple of those reels went quote unquote viral and all of these electricians and wannabe electricians on Facebook went out of their mind. I had so many comments from people telling me, oh, you used the wrong wiring. When you when when you buried these wires, you used the wrong wires. And keep in mind, this master electrician who was my instructor, he's the one who really coordinated the whole thing. You know, he did all of the outside electrical work. He made sure everything looked good on the inside. So it wasn't like I was just a homeowner playing with some wires. <laughs> it wasn't like that at all. And everybody online, they just came out of the woodwork to tell me that my shed was going to burn down. 
you know, all of these things that they had said to me were a little ridiculous. And some of them were very sexist, to be honest with you. I mean, people were saying things like, oh, you should stay in the kitchen and make sandwiches. And I'm like, wow, wow. They see a woman doing something that is typically a quote unquote man's job. And all of these comments were directed at me as if I didn't know what I was doing. And, you know, there weren't any, no, I can't say there weren't any, there were, there were plenty of kudos from people who were impressed that a woman would tackle this project. But there was much more. And this is why I say, like, Facebook sometimes can get really hateful. But there were many more comments that that just told me it was all wrong. It looked horrible. (laughs) Um, The wires were pinched in the rafters of my shed and so that my shed is going to burn down. Well, it's been since February. I've I've had no electrical problems at all in the shed. And quite frankly, (laughs) I feel like I need to do another video and just, you know, or even go back to that original post or reel on Facebook and just comment to some of those people like, hey, I just want to let you know my shed's still standing. You were wrong. So (laughs) when you do a project that's so controversial like that, it can feel terrible because you feel attacked, right? Like you, you feel like people were... Uh, commenting on your gender, they, you feel like they're attacking your intelligence. I mean, yeah, I mean, I I got called, you know, some names, people even popped up in the DMs to tell me, yeah, you shouldn't be making videos. And (laughs) at first it was, it felt, it felt really bad at first. Like I, I really felt, what's the word? (sighs) Stressed. I guess, I guess that's the biggest, the best word to describe. I felt stressed when I first realized, oh my gosh, all these comments are coming at me and people are in my DMs. However, the bright side is that this was a reel that I put out and was actually making money on, you know, like we cr- content creators, we can create content and make money on the stuff that we put out. And I made, I'm not going to lie to you. I made $4,000 off of that video because of all the comments of all these men on Facebook coming out to tell me how dumb I was. And little did they know I made $4,000. I made more money on that video on Facebook than the cost of me hiring the master electrician to come and help oversee the project. (laughs) I mean, think about that. All of that controversy, controversy, can never say that word. All of that controversy earned me more money than the cost that I had to. So I ended up netting a thousand dollars off of that video just because people wanted to come out of the woodwork and tell me how dumb I am that I should stay in the kitchen. You know, you don't know what you're doing. Your shed's going to burn down. So sometimes controversy actually works to your advantage. And once I realized, wow, I'm actually making money from this. I just was rolling with the punches. You know, I was giving it back to them (laughs) just to draw them in even more and getting a laugh out of it. And then it wasn't stressful. It was like, you know what? Oh, okay. I'm going to make this work for my benefit here. But to update you, the shed has been fine. All the electrical, I've had no problem at all with the electrical. All right, moving on to number three, a pink vanity. This vanity, oh my goodness, everybody and their mama wanted to come out to YouTube, which it's gotten, I want to say maybe 2 million views from several years ago to tell me that this 1980 vanity that I painted looked horrible. Now that wasn't everybody. Again, some people just love to state their opinions. For the most part, everyone liked it. But there were a lot of people that was like, oh my gosh, you, you shouldn't have painted that. That was an antique. And I tried to tell them an antique is something that is at least a hundred years old. Something that's vintage is less than a hundred years old. So, you know, and it says on the bottom, it's stamped 1980. It was sitting in a thrift store for $10. I think I paid $10, $15 for this French provincial vanity. And I ended up painting the bottom or the body of it and finish the top, sanded it down. I didn't use any stain. I just put like a, I think like a clear lacquer or something on the top and it looked beautiful. I'm looking at it right now as I'm talking to you. It's here down in the basement, which has been my work area. I still haven't fully transitioned to the she shed yet. And 
It's so pretty. It still looks pretty. It's where I was doing my sewing before, of course, I painted that sewing cabinet. So now I'm going to have to find some other place for it in the house since I have no use for it as, oh, you know what? It might, oh, I just had an idea. Oh my goodness. <laughs> You're not going to believe this. Okay. So as I'm talking to you, I just realized it would make a great desk in my she shed. Oh my goodness. Okay great. Because I was thinking, I was like, I'm, I'm going to need a desk for my she shed. And I didn't really feel like building one. And I could go to the thrift store and try to find one. But this vanity is perfect. I might just do that. I might just do that. Okay. See, I love this. I love this podcast. I come up with great ideas as I'm talking to you. <laughs> All right. But that's, that's what happened to the vanity. It's, it's been wonderful, you know, down here in the in the basement, but it's going to go in my shed as a desk. Now we just figured that out. Um, but yeah, whenever you paint furniture, people are always going to come out of the woodwork and tell you, Oh, you shouldn't have done that. It's, it, it doesn't look good. Especially if you paint it pink, pink is this color that you either love it or you hate it. And every now and then you'll have people that will say, you know, pink's not my color, but I really like this shade of pink. So you know, you take it or leave it. Me, I love pink. I love every shade of soft pastel pink. It just makes me feel so good. And I've told you this before. I am a complete tomboy on the inside. <laughs> Growing up, I wanted to be a boy. I mean, you know, at six years old, I'm sitting, I'll tell you something really, really private, but this is just between you and I. When I was probably about, I would say probably five or six, and I would hang out with the boys and I wanted to be a boy, I would actually go to the bathroom. I would pee sitting backwards on the toilet <laughs> because that's what, that's what boys, well, boys didn't sit down, but boys would stand up and face the opposite direction. And that's what I wanted to do. So I went through that little phase of, I want to be a boy. This is how boys pee. So I'm going to pee this way. <laughs> oh my goodness. Crazy. And it wasn't until I would say the summer after sixth grade that I, that I decided that I wanted to look like a girl, right? Like I was still interested in boys, but I was very boyish. I played baseball, basketball, all that until about seventh grade. And the summer before seventh grade is when I decided, you know what? I want to look like a, a girl again. Because <laughs> I had longer hair and probably about third grade. So from third grade to six, I had my hair cut into this little short afro, but I didn't have the right products to make it look good. So it was just like this frizzy, afro with without hair gel. I mean, it just didn't look good. And when I was in uh, right before seventh grade, I got my first relaxer. And now my hair was straight. And I'm swinging it around. And I'm like, Oh, my gosh, I look like a girl. And I wore a dress, this little jean dress with the white Ked Bobo sneakers. <laughs> they weren't Keds because we couldn't afford Keds. They were these little white, you know, quote, unquote, Keds. And this turquoise t-shirt underneath of the jean dress. Oh my gosh. Everyone thought I was my sister. They just, they didn't know it was me. <laughs> and from then on, you know, I've always still been a tomboy, but now I look like a girl and I love lipstick and makeup and all that good stuff, but don't get it twisted. I'm still very much me on the inside. Okay. Sorry for that little aside. All right. <laughs> moving on to number four, <laughs> the painted stairs. Now, this wasn't so much a controversial project, but it did get some comments from people because I was going from, well, no, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I did get some comments because people didn't like the fact that I was painting my stairs. This house is, let's see, a 1970, 1973 home, and the stairs going from the main level up to the, to the bedrooms was just a set of pine stairs. I mean, it was a nice... I think it was a nice set of wood. Like it wasn't in bad condition, but it was that golden oak color. And I didn't want to sand them down and refinish them a different color because then they would, they would not match the flooring that's in the house. But I wanted something, two things. I wanted white stairs. And the second thing is that I wanted a runner because everybody in my house, except for me, knock on wood, everybody has fallen down those stairs. You know, you, you come to the top, it gets slippery. And I just really wanted to put something there that was, would cushion the stairs and give you a little bit more grip. So I had done uh, 
two coats of white paint on the stairs. And then I did, and I'll, of course, I'll leave a comment down below if this is something that you want to do to your stairs. And then I did some, uh, some runners and it looked great, but some people were like, why would you paint your stairs? Like that was a beautiful, you know, set of wood stairs. And I thought, yeah, but it just, to me, it just looked outdated, right? I don't like golden oak. The floors in my house are golden oak and I don't like them. <laughs> I deal with them because I'm not ready to strip them down and restain them, but it's not my preferred color. And I thought this would be a great way to warm up the stairs, maybe muffle some of the, uh, the creaks as you're going up and down. And another issue that people had said was, well, you know, white stairs is going to show a lot of dirt. And I said, you know, I'm okay with that, actually, because the stairs are going to get dirty anyway. And if it's golden oak, you're not going to see the dirt. Well, if there's dirt there, I want to see it. Because if I see it, I'm going to be more likely to want to clean it up. And that's been the case. So yes, if you paint your stairs white, I do see more dirt on the stairs. Because it's visible, right? The sides, you know, from the left and right, where the wood well, what used to be wood is peeking out, I do see more dust. But because of that, I vacuum my stairs much more frequently than I did when it was golden oak. Before, you couldn't see the dust and it just built up, but it was still there. So now that I'm aware that the dust is there, I vacuum my stairs more often. So overall, I'm happy with the stairs. I will tell you that I haven't had any chipping. I haven't had any peeling. And I did this same process for the stairs going down to my basement. And I was a little concerned at that time because I didn't do any sanding on those stairs. Now, the one going from the foyer up to the bedrooms, those I did actually do a light sanding. And I used an orbital sander for that. The ones going down to the basement, I didn't do any sanding. I just took regular, was it a gloss paint? I want to say it was like a regular gloss latex paint, just the kind you get from Home Depot or Lowe's. And I didn't do any sanding and I just painted it. And I was worried that the children going up and down the stairs, maybe the paint would chip, but surprisingly, that's actually held up. I, I don't think those areas get a lot of wear and tear. So if you're somebody who's considering painting your stairs, you can do it. Even if, I would definitely recommend just taking a little bit of light sandpaper. You don't have to use a sander and roughing up the stairs on the side where you're going to see the paint and then doing two coats of paint. But just a heads up, you will see more dust and dirt, but it it is sort of that visual reminder. Oh, you know what? It is time to vacuum the stairs. So I love it. I would still paint my stairs over again if I had to do it. And I love the way it looks. Okay, moving on to number four, or sorry, this is number five the spray painted welcome mat. Now this wasn't so much controversial, but it was something that went quote unquote viral. I say quote unquote viral because when I think viral, I think like 3 million, 4 million views. And I don't think this had quite as many views, but it is something that people were shocked that I had done because it's a, it's a, it's a welcome mat. And people were like, well, <laughs> that spray paint is not going to hold up. I can just imagine what that's going to look like, you know, in a couple months. Well, surprisingly, it held up a long time. I still have that welcome mat that I'm using. I'm using it for the back door. And there's some chipping, of course, it's not as fresh as the first day when I did it. But surprisingly, that paint spray paint stayed on that mat very well. So if you are considering painting your welcome mat, and this is just like a rubber mat. It's not the kind that has the bristles or anything. And I think you could probably spray paint that with the bristles. But with the rubber, it worked very well. And the only thing you have to be careful of is if you're cleaning it, you don't want to use a pressure washer because that pressure coming out of the pressure washer could chip the paint. But if you're just, you know, hosing it down, yeah, if you have a rubber mat, do some spray paint and you can have fun with it. And you know, you can get a mat for, gosh, I don't know, 10 bucks, maybe $15 and spray paint it and give it a little bit of creativity and know that it's going to last. So, or here's an idea. I think when I posted that, someone had said, oh, I love this idea. I'm going to do this, but I'm going to hang it on my wall. So you could actually make wall art 
if you find one that's, you know, that's cute enough, you can do some spray paint different designs or whatever, and put it inside your house, do something creative, put it in like, I don't know, put it in a corner or like a wall or a door that maybe you don't use that frequently, but you still want something there as like a welcome mat. Okay, number six, my painted shower. (laughs) I don't think this was so much controversial versus it did kind of go viral because it was such an, it was so shocking, the difference between this turquoise 1970 shower and then suddenly you've got this beautiful white, beautiful, like bright shower that I mean, I think the cost of the materials probably was about $200 or less. And this was in, I want to say this was about January 2017, because at that time I was doing a master bathroom makeover and a company had reached out to me and wanted to offer me this product, right? This epoxy shower product called Bath Works. And, you know, I said to them, hey, surprisingly, I'm actually renovating my bathroom right well not renovating I'm decorating my bathroom right now and I do have this 1970s turquoise shower stall fiberglass it's just oh I I can't get tile and a glass door because you know I had somebody come and quote me and that was like six thousand (laughs) dollars so I didn't want to pay six thousand dollars to get the kind of shower that I wanted but I also didn't want to leave it turquoise now I could have done something a little less expensive maybe I could have gone to Home Depot and paid them to install uh, maybe a white shower stall, and it would have been less money. But still, even then, it probably could have been about $2,000. So a fraction of what the tile would have cost, but still much more than what my budget was going to allow. So when they reached out, when Bathworks had reached out, I thought, well, this would be a great opportunity to see if these these epoxy painting kits actually work. And you're not going to believe this, but it worked. I still get comments. And and again, this is from 2017. I still get comments from people finding this video on YouTube and asking me, hey, is is this holding up? Like, you know, did it last? And I can tell you, (laughs) it has last. It has lasted. I have a couple of chips, but they've been there for several years. And I think what it was is our shower had this metal, what do you call it? Like a metal drain and it didn't stay in place. And so every now and then it would, you know, it just kind of wasn't a stopper, but it was like a strainer, I think you can call it. And every now and then the strainer would kind of scratch the paint. And so there's a couple chip marks there just because of that, but they never spread. They didn't further chip. And I can tell you in all honesty that this epoxy shower bathworks kit it worked it worked now I don't know how long it's going to last for like I said it's been since 2017 and it was only what $200 I think you know they sent the kit to me so I didn't pay for it but if I had paid for it $200 and I've gotten like five more years out of this shower so you know if you're somebody that has a- an old epoxy shower maybe it's a color that you don't like or maybe it's maybe it's not fiberglass, maybe it's just like a, you know, regular tub, but it's kind of stained and you want to freshen it up. You can get this Bathworks kit and do it yourself. You follow the instructions, look at my video, I'll leave a link down below. It's really about preparation. So if you do the right preparation, then it's going to work and it's going to last. So, um, yeah, so it worked, it worked. And and I think some of the controversy, I cannot say this word today. (laughs) Some of the controversy was, oh, yeah, that's not going to work or that's going to chip. That's going to peel. Well, no, it didn't. It didn't chip or peel in the way that you're thinking. Now, I think Rust-Oleum makes one that you might be able to find at Home Depot. I can't recommend it because I've never used it. But I feel like if you go on to YouTube, you might find some videos of Rust-Oleum and maybe you can research that. But I stand wholeheartedly behind the Bathworks kit. Even if you've got tile, like wall tile, you know, let's say you've got like the pink wall tile from 1970s, you can use the Bathworks on that. So don't feel that you have to bust out the paint or, I mean, bust out the tiles and redo all the tiles. Maybe you would like to do that, but your budget may not allow for it. So get something like Bathworks, go over it, 
and it'll look pretty good and it'll last. And the only thing is you have to make sure that you're not using uh, abrasive materials. So Comet, um, scrub brushes, those generally are frowned upon because you don't want anything to scratch the epoxy of this painting kit. Now I will tell you, I did actually use some yesterday. I cleaned the shower yesterday and I did use some Comet and a scrub brush because <laughs> I think what happens is, you know, the floor of a shower, especially if you're using this kit, it's got, what do you call it? It's like this, hmm, it's an anti-skid material that you use to put on the floor so that, you know, once you have it epoxied, you don't want it to be slippery. So they have this, this anti-skid material that you kind of work into the paint or in the epoxy. And after a number of years, the only thing that, that I've experienced with the Bathworks kit is that if you're not cleaning it every single week, it can get stained where your feet are, right? Like where the, it can get dirty on the bottom. So, you know, after cleaning this with just scrubbing bubbles, yesterday I was like, you know, I have to scrub this. <laughs> and I tried to do it very lightly. I didn't want to mess it up. And yeah, whatever dirt was there came up and it looks looks beautiful. So yeah, it's, it's controversial because it's, it's an epoxy. It's a paint. Now I will tell you, I have seen on Facebook, there's a paint that I'd recommended before called heirloom traditions, paint HTP. And I think, I don't remember, you have to just Google it. I think it's like all in one paint.com. I've seen people in their Facebook group say that they have used this in their shower and on their tiles I don't know, honestly, if that works. And if it does work, how long it's going to last. I don't think anything <laughs> compared to this epoxy is going to last for as long as I've had good success with Bathworks. So if you're doing your research and you do come across the Heirloom Traditions paint and you're considering using that in your shower and your tile, I would say, you know what? Don't do it. Just get the Bathworks. Try that. It is stinky. You will have to use one of those respirator masks. However, it's it's pretty good. And I think they may have just come out with one that might be, is it just water-based? I think one that doesn't smell because they reached out to me. Bathworks, is, it's pretty cool. It's a family-owned business. They reached out to me just about a month ago and they said, hey, we've got these new products and we're going to you know, want to promote them, are you available? So that may be coming down the pike for me, but I'm not telling you all this because I'm trying to promote them because of like, I'm getting paid. I'm not, I'm just telling you, if you have that problem of an ugly shower, whether it's white fiberglass or, you know, some other material, you can use this and it will work and save you money. Okay. The last one, number seven is my she shed drywall. Oh man, this was another very, very controversial project because now I didn't do the work, but the reason why it was so controversial is because the installers didn't really follow the normal pattern of how you install drywall. Typically drywall, you always do the ceiling first and then you do the walls. And the reason why is because, okay, let's take a normal ceiling, a normal flat ceiling. When you're putting drywall up, you're using either a drywall lift or if you've got several people, you're, you're installing it onto the, the, the floor studs, right? Or the rafters, whatever you want to call it. But um, you need something to hold that up. Now you're using the screws to do it, the drywall screws. But once you have that drywall in place on the ceiling, the ones that you install on the walls helps to hold it up, right? Like right there at that corner where the ceiling meets the wall that drywall goes up on the ceiling first and then walls. Well, the drywall crew that came into my she shed, they did it the opposite way. <laughs> they did the, the, the walls first going up from the floor up and then they did the ceiling. And I was a little curious about why they were doing that. But as I mentioned in a previous episode, uh, I will leave the link down below. Hopefully I don't forget to put it there. But I was wondering... I wonder why they did it that way. Because I've always known drywall to go ceiling first, then walls. Ceiling, then walls. They did walls, then ceiling. Well, when I posted that clip on Facebook as a reel, so many people came out of the woodwork to tell me that it looked like crap. And the way that they, the way that the installers had created 
butt joints. Now a butt joint is when you've got two pieces of drywall coming together. And typically you're not going to want to do that right over top of the seams, or I should say right over the, the end points of a door because it's, it can crack over time, right? Now they're going to be taping this, but it can crack. Well, that's what my installers did. <laughs> they actually installed butt joints right over top of the corners of my doors. So the people looking at these videos, they pointed all this stuff out. Your drywall is going to crack. It looks bad. It's going to fall down. It's, And that was in February of 2022. So we're, what, eight months, I think, maybe eight months down the road. And I haven't had any problem with the drywall. I've not noticed any peeling, cracking, shifting. Now, are those things going to happen? Possibly. Maybe the people are right on Facebook. But it looks good. It still looks good. And even though I would have done it differently as well with starting at the ceiling and working down, when I talked to the drywall company itself, I, I called them, I said, Hey, I just want to make sure, you know, uh, is there a warranty on this? <laughs> because they did start from the walls and work their way up. And she's like, well, I checked with the head person. And he says that typically, yes, if it's a flat ceiling, they'll do the ceiling first and then the walls but you had a slope. My my ceiling actually comes to a point. I paid for that to be a little bit more sloped, right? I had um, scissor truss instead of just like a normal truss. And they told me, they were like, yep, but because your ceilings were sloped, you can do it either way. So I thought, all right, crossing my fingers. I hope you're right. But it looks good. I haven't had any problems. My shed is on a foundation, and it's not on the ground. And so I don't know, maybe, maybe it's, it's more secure because it's on a foundation. It's not shifting and cracking or anything like that, but I've had good results. So now, now what would be a really interesting show is to talk about, you know, what are some of those projects where the audience had it right? That right. Like if they were to call out a project and say, oh my gosh, you did this wrong and that's going to happen. And sure enough, that happened, but that's never happened before. <laughs> I don't think there's anything that somebody had said, oh my gosh, you did that. Well, this is the consequence you're going to suffer and then have them be right. It hasn't happened yet. I hope it doesn't happen. So let that be proof that sometimes you're going to get comments from people that are going to tell you what's going to happen. You did this wrong. Your shed's going to burn down. Your, your fire pit's going to look like crap. Like, all these negative comments coming at you, yeah, maybe they could be helpful in some kind of way, but sometimes it's just hate. And those haters are going to hate no matter what. You do you, enjoy your projects, enjoy the time that you put into it, the learning experience. And, you know, if somebody happens to be right, well, then you've learned from that. Then that's fine. That's something you can talk about in your next project. <laughs> you know, it's not... It's not the end of the world if you make a mistake. But again, sometimes people are willing to point out mistakes that really aren't even something that's going to affect your project. And these are just seven. These are just seven. There's many other projects I've done, maybe not quite so controversial, but other projects I've done where people have called things out and it hasn't really yielded anything, right? Like it hasn't been the end of the world. My projects are still fine. But anyway, let this be motivation for you to continue to do your DIY projects. Share them with your friends and family. Don't worry about the comments people make because people will make comments. But for the most part, people are going to give you kudos for a job well done. All right. I hope that you enjoyed this episode. I loved talking about these projects. And I think this might be a really good YouTube video. I would love to get some footage of where these projects are now and then do a YouTube video. We'll see. We'll see. I hope you're subscribed. If you're not subscribed, go to Thrift Diving on YouTube and you can subscribe to my channel and get updates for, be sure to hit that bell to get notified when new videos are released. Right now I'm operating so slow. <laughs> it's been a month since I've uploaded a video and I feel so bad about that. But right now I am currently editing my vinyl flooring video from the She Shed. Oh my gosh, you're not going to believe how amazing it looks. Like the, sh the floor looks so good. There's things scattered all about in there right now. 
And that's what I need to do this week is to go through and just take out the things that don't need to be in there. You know, there were some Halloween things in there and start thinking about how I'm going to make this look pretty, right? I, oh, let me tell you, um, <laughs> I'm so excited about this. I went to Costco tonight and I bought a 43 inch TV for my she shed. I have the perfect wall for it. I just need to get, I probably got to go to Home Depot tomorrow and get a uh, TV mount so that I can mount it up on the studs. But yeah, I wanted a TV in there. Not that I watch a lot of TV. I'm usually listening to podcasts or listening to audiobooks, but I think it would be nice to have a TV in there and get some good speakers and be able to just have something to watch while I'm in there instead of staring at a small iPad screen. <laughs> anyway, how are you doing this week? I would love to find out if there's any projects that you're working on. Do you need any help with things? Are you stuck? Are you struggling with something? Or did you do a project that you're just feeling so proud of and you want to share it with me? Send me an email, serena at thriftdiving.com. If you have a question about a project, um, or if there's something that I've done, a project that I've done, or even a personal question, <laughs> send me an email, serene at thriftdiving.com. You can also find me over at Instagram at thriftdiving and come back next week because we're always doing something fun here at Thrift Diving. So I can't wait to speak to you next week. Have a great week and I will talk to you next episode. Diving. Find it ugly, make it pretty. Mm. Paint a power tools all right. Saving money with those thrift store vibes. Hey, yeah, thrift diving. Mm -mm. Find it ugly.